Okay, so we are now in Matthew chapter 6. We are now in the second of the three chapters that we know as the Sermon on the Mount. The, I think it would be helpful for us just to very, very briefly remember the context that we are in. That Jesus, like John the Baptist before him, has proclaimed this message to Israel. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Throughout the Old Testament, there was uh, a promise to Israel of a coming kingdom. And Jesus, who is the Messiah, the Messianic King, he has now come. And he says, the kingdom is now right before you. Here it is. All you have to do if you want a place in that kingdom is to repent. And repentance is an important thing. Repentance is an acknowledgement of the sovereignty of God. It is acknowledging that God is in charge. He decides what is right, what is wrong, what is good, what is bad. And what we are doing in repenting is not really just saying sorry. It's a turning from our way of living and a subscribing to his way of living as an act of faith and an act of trust that God is in charge and he knows what he's doing. It is turning to his way as opposed to our own way. And for those who do repent, Jesus is now teaching them in this Sermon on the Mount, how should a repentant person live? And he began with the Beatitudes, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And in that whole section, he was dealing with what does a repentant person look like? And what are the blessings that come from turning to God and turning away from our own ways? And the last section that we did over the last month or so, from verse 21 to verse 48 of chapter 5, was Jesus addressing what the Pharisees had taught. Now, the Pharisees had so much power. They were in charge. Everybody feared them. They were the ones who were considered the best. And Jesus just goes straight for the jugular. He basically says they were wrong. And he says, you have heard, referring to what the Pharisees taught, but I say to you, and then he interprets the law of Moses, the Mosaic law, the rule of life for Israel. He interprets it how it should have been understood and not how the Pharisees were understanding it. And most importantly of all, the Pharisees had been looking at the law and seeing how they could check their boxes. Have I done this? Yep, check. Have I done that? Yep, check. Without actually pursuing the righteousness that the law demanded. And as such, Jesus began that whole section in verse 20 saying, I say to you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. In other words, what he's saying is, is you've, you've got to be going for righteousness far more than they are. And that's a radical statement. They were considered in that society to be the most righteous people. And yet, Jesus says, no, 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 they're not righteous enough. And that was a weird thing for people to hear. But Jesus has now explained it in this last section that we did in chapter 5 by showing how they are not pursuing righteousness. So where the law said, thou shalt not murder, the Pharisees were going, check, I haven't killed anybody. But Jesus is saying, look, murder comes about because of hatred in our hearts. How are you doing with your hatred? Are you, are you, are you, you know, hating on people to an extent that it's impacting your life? Is your hatred serious or mild? Because the righteousness of the law that says thou shalt not murder is being violated when you wish somebody was dead. In the same way, Thou shalt not commit adultery. Pharisees were able to go, check, I haven't done that. And Jesus is saying, initially, he is saying, well, when you're looking at someone lustfully, 
then you have violated that command. And in fact, he then exposes that the Pharisees went beyond that. And what they were doing was some of them were saying, well, you know what? I don't like my wife anymore. We'll get rid of her, have a divorce, have another wife. And Jesus has said, you've just done the same thing, but you're doing it in a way that you can check your box. And so he is condemning the Pharisees and explaining to the people who have repented how they should be living in light of the law and teaching them to pursue righteousness. And we ended last week with the last verse of chapter 5. You'll see it in front of you uh, there. Therefore you are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. There is a righteousness that is demanded that goes far beyond the Pharisees. How are we supposed to respond to that? The answer is that none of us can accomplish that, not in ourselves. No one's perfect. And yet the requirement is perfection. So what is a person to do? Well, he dealt with that at the beginning of chapter 5. We're to mourn, mourn over our sin. We are to pursue righteousness and we're to be utterly dependent upon God. And this is why when we come to Romans, as we spent our midweeks doing recently, we understand what Paul is saying is that none of us can meet the righteous requirements of the law. And that is why people are saved by their faith and not by their works. People are saved because they trust in God, not because they are perfect. And it is through that trust that the perfection of Christ is applied to us. That's the only way a person can be saved. And so when we understand the righteous requirements of the law, anybody seeing that would know that they are without hope and they would cry out to God. And it is in fact that crying out to him that causes a person to be saved as they place their trust in him. Now, as we come to chapter 6, Jesus is now going to step up his assault on the Pharisees. He is going to show that not only have they not met the righteous requirements of the law, but they have completely violated it. And he's going to give us a bunch of examples of how we should live if we are living righteously. And he is going to give examples where the Pharisees have very publicly failed. So in other words, we're going from the end of chapter 5 where he says, you've heard them say this and they're wrong, let me tell you what's right. And now he's going to be saying, you've seen them do wrong, don't do what they do. So he's kind of stepping up the ante, as it were. He's, he's showing that these people who are regarded as religious and righteous are not righteous at all. And in fact, they are going to be models of how not to live. And so we have, as we had in chapter 5, verse 20, a summary statement in verse six, uh, sorry, chapter 6 and verse 1. And then we're going to have a couple of examples of the principle. So let's look at the principle in verse 1. This is our main principle for the entirety of this section right the way through to verse 24. So this is our governing principle. Beware of doing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them. Otherwise you have no reward with your Father who is in heaven. Now this is important. So we're going to take some time to unpack every part of this. There is a clear distinction here. When you do what is right, that's what he's been talking about for chapter 5. When you do what is right, do it for your Father who is in heaven. Don't do it for men who are on earth. This is one of the hardest things for us to really, truly embrace. Because sometimes God seems very distant. Sometimes God seems far away. And so living in a way that pleases him doesn't give us the immediate satisfaction, doesn't give us the immediate assurance, doesn't give us the immediate um, sort of encouragement 
that we get from our fellow man, fellow people. You know, I need to live my life in a way that pleases God. And I hope that one day when I go, in, when I go to be with him, that I will hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. But for now, the only assurance I get from God is I can read in the Bible, yep, that's what you're supposed to have said. Yep, that's what you're supposed to have done. And I have to take encouragement from that. But if I'm really honest with you, I'm far more encouraged when my wife says, good job. You know, I mean, we all have our different love languages. And I often joke with her that I am a golden retriever. I, I am just like, say, good boy, pat me on the head a few times. I'm good as gold. You can do whatever else you like to me. You can treat me awfully. Then just say, oh, I'm sorry. Good boy. Give me a stroke. I'm good. I'm fine. I am the human golden retriever. So, so words mean a lot, you know, and when, when you're encouraged, it means a lot. And when you're put down, it hurts a lot. And we, we, we are all of us tempted to live in a way that pleases and gets the encouragement and the affirmation of those around us. And we always shy away from conflicts and being put down and people not liking us and what have you. And, and so on the one hand, some of these examples that Jesus is going to give are quite striking and quite extreme. But I want us to understand that on the other hand, this is something that is going to tempt all of us. And, and the root of this is simply, because we can justify it, can't we? We can say, well, I'm more this type of person. And we can justify it and say, well, you know, it's not a bad thing that this person liked what I had to say. And it's not a bad thing that I don't want conflict with this person. And we can justify it in all sorts of different ways. But this is the bottom line, folks. The problem here is that we fear man and we don't fear God. That's our problem. We are more concerned by the affirmation from our fellow man now, here on earth, then we are concerned about the affirmation from our Father in heaven at a much later point in time. That's our problem. And so the command here is one that we all need to take great notice of. Beware of doing your righteousness before men. Be really, really careful, saints. Be careful. That when, even when you do what is right, that you don't do it so that people see you doing what's right. Be really, really careful. Beware. Danger. There is a potential pitfall here that we can all fall into. If I'm really honest, I want you all to like me. But I have to fear God more. And I have to be prepared for you to not like me if that's what doing the right thing, if that's what speaking the truth means. And you all need to be the same. We need to be far more concerned by what God thinks than by what those around us think. The other thing that comes out in this central verse is not just the contrast between men, before men who are noticed, they're here with us, and the contrast with the Father who is in heaven, he's distant, he's away. The other thing here that is clear in the second half of the verse is the otherwise. Otherwise, you have no reward with your Father who is in heaven. The point here is very, very clear. If you want to impress people, and they're impressed, then that's your reward. In other words, you can do the right thing, and there's no eternal reward for you, because the reward that you get, you got now. Now, we dealt with this in a midweek study a couple of weeks back. I think it was Tim who had the question, and we dealt with... 
um, the, the whole concept of um, rewards and eternal rewards. And the Bible is very clear on this point that what will happen to us is that when we come to see Christ, that all of the wasteful, empty things that we did with our lives, that if we are truly saved, if we have saving faith, if we've repented, and if we have trusted in God and His ways, then despite all of our sin and all of our failings and all of our imperfections, they are, they are burnt up. And we go to heaven purified. But every good deed that we do, though they may not be perfect, they are purified and we take them as rewards with us into eternity. As Christians, we so heavily, and rightly so, we so heavily emphasize salvation by faith. Because we're not saved by our works, that there is sometimes a danger that we don't mention that there are rewards for works as Christians. That we get to do things that nobody sees and one day we'll come to God and we will have rewards for those deeds that will last us forever. That time you spent in prayer that nobody saw. That sacrifice you made so that you could give your time, your energy, your effort. Giving is far more than money. That, that time that you sacrificed. That person that you loved. That effort that you made. That time that you humbled yourself realized that your interpretation of scripture was wrong and changed your mind. Man, isn't that a hard one? God sees it all and he will reward. But when you publicize your righteousness, when you seek the approval of your fellow man, that is your reward. Can I, can I just point out how ridiculously stupid this is? Hey guys, I don't know what you did this morning, but I got up, had a cup of coffee, and I spent an hour in prayer with my Lord. I just wanted to let you know, because I think that, you know, if we all did this, man, what a difference we could make. Sounds so righteous, doesn't it? And what you should be thinking at that point is, Man, I pray for an hour and now I have no reward other than the people here who think I'm great. But most of them are clued up and just think I'm proud. What a waste! What a waste! Don't do things to be applauded by your fellow men. There is an audience of one. There's an audience of one. He is the one to whom we give our prayers and our praise. He is the one who we seek to please. He is the only one that matters. And you know, sometimes we're going to do and say things, and they may well be the right thing to do and say, and we may get a lot of hate, and we may have a lot of rejection, and there may be a lot of bad consequences, and there may be a lot of people that turn against us. You have to have it sorted in your head beforehand that you are here to please an audience of one. And I don't even mean your spouse. Our Father in heaven. He is the only one that we are seeking to please. So that's our principle in verse 1. And Jesus has set us up now with that single verse. We'll come back to it each week and just remind ourselves of it. Because that is the context that is going to take us through most of this chapter. Are you trying to please your fellow man? Are you trying to impress your fellow man? Or are you only concerned about the Lord? Now the, it's all well and good. and I, I find this a lot in Christian circles. You can teach people principles... 
And the church could be there going, yeah, oh yeah, agree with that principle. Oh mm, yeah, good one, pastor. Oh yeah. Here's an example of how we apply. Oh, I'm not sure about that. Sometimes when you put legs on these principles, so to speak, sometimes when you start to analyze and look at specifics, how do, what does this look like practically? People can get a little bit more shaken. So let's see how much you need shaking today, because I certainly need shaking in all of these areas. So the first example here is in verse 2. We're going to see in each of these occasions, it starts with a when. Therefore, when, in verse 2, he's going to talk about giving. Awkward topic, pastors come in two categories. Those who want to talk about giving all the time, you'll see those ones on your TVs a lot if you watch those kind of channels. If you do, turn them off. You shouldn't watch them. Um, and then there's the kind of pastors that don't like talking about it at all. And then when we teach verse by verse through scripture, we're forced to deal with these topics. Another good reason for expository teaching. So, therefore, when you give, that's our first category here in verse 2. But look ahead, and when you are, uh, sorry, verse 6. But you, when you pray, when you pray, verse 5. When you are praying, verse 7. Uh, when you give to the poor, verse 3. These are all the little reminders to us. Verse 16, now whenever you fast... But when you fast, so these repetitions of when, these are telling us about the specifics of when we apply the principle of verse 1. So here's our first example, giving. Therefore, when you give to the poor, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, so that they may be glorified by men. Truly, I say to you, they have their reward in full but when you give to the poor do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving will be in secret and your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you it's where we need to be really challenged i think and we need to understand what is being said here let's look at the context culturally a bit more when people came to the temple there was under mosaic law the tithe the tithe oh gosh tithing 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 horrible topic so many christians think that tithing is something that we do today it was part of mosaic law mosaic law ended with the death of christ it wasn't a parallel to new testament giving at all because it was more a parallel of taxation there were three different ties it's just not as simple as people want it to be but so many churches they want to say give 10 percent why it's just convenient it's just convenient. If everybody in a congregation gives 10% of their income, you're all right. You're going to get by. You're going to pay your bills. Church is going to happen. Life's going to go on. Everybody's safe. <clears throat> and if you have enough people, you make a lot of money. Mormons, man, they have it drilled into them. Tithe, 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 tithe. And that's how they own most of Pepsi Cola and a whole bunch of other investments and stuff. And so it makes sense. It's, it's convenient for a pastor, but it's not biblical. As I said, in the Old Covenant, there were three separate tithes. So it wasn't 10%, it was 23% on average, because one of those tithes was every three years. And they came for different things, and it mostly was in accordance with taxation. Some of it was in accordance with welfare. And, and there was a variety of different purposes. So what happened is that everybody had to give their tithe, everybody had to give their tax. After they'd given that tithe, there were voluntary donations. And there in where they met in the temple, there were 13 <clears throat> big boxes. And people could come in and they could put their volunt they put their tithe in, which everybody had to do, and then they would put their voluntary offering in as well. And the really wealthy people, they could give more. And I've said this before about tithing, I make no apologies. There will be some people who are struggling financially for whom you should not tithe. Giving 10% of your income away would be irresponsible because you might have children that need to be fed, and rent that needs to be paid, and just because somebody once told you you need to give your 10%, you think that you're obliged to do that, and you're not, and it would be wrong for you to do so. For some people, 10% is too much if they're struggling financially. 
But if you're super, super rich and you have to give away 10% of your income, I mean, man, you can still have your three houses, your five cars and your, your, your vacations and whatever you want. It makes no difference. Because you only had to give 10% of your huge income rather than, rather than uh, 10% of a small income, which could, like I say, be, be enough to stop you eating or your kids from eating. So when the, when the wealthy people had given their tithe, they had so much more left over. And it was a practice that some of the super wealthy would say, okay, everyone done their tithes? Okay, voluntary donation time. Hey, uh, servants, do you want to just go ahead and blow the trumpet? And they literally blew a trumpet. They literally blew a trumpet. Hey, pay attention. So-and-so is uh, giving now. Oh, I'm so glad so-and-so gives. Man, that, that helps us repair our roof and that helps us kind of keep on top of this and that. Oh, we're so thankful for so-and-so. Oh, good old so-and-so. And everyone knows because the trumpets are blown. And they know that they need to be dependent upon him because they know that he's the one who is paying the way. And so they would have their trumpets blown. And often the Pharisees were the richest people. So when he says, do not sound a trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do, he is calling Pharisees hypocrites. And by the way, sometimes the people who weren't Pharisees, who gave a lot of money, they were allowed to come and sit next to the rabbis in the service. Come and sit next to the rabbis. So everybody's looking up at the stage, you know. It would be like, it would be as if, here I am preaching a sermon, it would be like there are choir stalls behind me, which we used to have a few years ago, and somebody was allowed to sit here behind me on the stage during the service, just because of how much money they gave. That's why the book of James, we taught through James a few years ago, that's why the book of James says, do not give preference to those, don't give special seats to those who give. No partiality towards the rich should never, ever happen. And the other problem they had in that society was because people got so much attention for their giving that people would often make these public pledges and then they never followed up. Have your kids ever been at school and done like a sponsored walk or something or some sponsored event? Man, collecting those things afterwards, that can often be more difficult than doing the walk itself. Because people are like, oh yeah, I'll pledge this. You walked how many miles? I wasn't expecting that. But they have problems with pledges and then trying to get people to follow up on what they promised to give. Now that's what was going on then. But you know, we don't blow trumpets anymore, right? I mean, we're not, we're not like those people. When I first came to this church, we would stop the worship midway through, and it's, now it's the time for the offertory. And the guy would play the piano, no one's singing, no one's doing worship, he's just playing the piano, and the plates would go around. Pass down each and every aisle, and it comes towards you, oh, you don't want to be that person who hasn't got their money ready, you don't want to be that person who, oh man, I haven't got anything. Are they going to see that this is a $1 and not a $20? I mean, you know, the pressure's on, right? And then if you're a visitor, you're coming to this church, and here you are, and I didn't bring any money, or I've got like 10 bucks, but that's for my lunch later, and now this plate is coming towards you, and it's like, ah! You're caught like, like a deer caught in the headlights. One of the first things I tried to do here was to get rid of all of that. And we did it in stages. First of all, we emphasized... Look, the things are being passed around. If you're a visitor, this is not for you. Just let it pass you by. We tried to get rid of that embarrassment. Then we tried to kind of stop it being an event. And we did a worship song. So we were continuing through worship. And they got passed through. And eventually we just got rid of the plates. I could, I'd love to have done it all in week one. But change takes time in Baptist churches. right? So now we have an offering box at the back. And I've mentioned that we have an offering box at the back. I think that's the first time I've mentioned it in about two years. I don't mention it. There are so many churches that have tarnished their reputation 
by talking about money and emphasizing giving and oh you got to give more give more and then the lord will bless you then the lord will heal you and all of this little nonsense your giving is nothing to do with me nothing it's between you and the lord that's it period just between you and him there, does the bible teach that we should give absolutely there are principles giving should be regular giving should be sacrificial if you never go without anything because you've given you've never really given and giving should be joyful and i don't think that when you see a plate coming in front of you and you feel obliged to put it in that that's joyful giving joyful comes from the heart i really want to share what i have with this church with this person with this situation with this charity i want to i have a desire to it will give me joy to do so that's got to come from within you no one should be standing over you with a stick that is not voluntary giving has to be voluntary and so we have a situation whereby we've tried to not make people feel awkward not create a situation where visitors feel threatened and at the same point here we are teaching it giving is important and there are blessings clearly the text is saying there's a reward to be had but if you do it publicly that's your reward gone People now see, oh, look how generous he is. And I tell you, we do this in society all the time. All the time. Hey, here's this public building. And look at the list of all the people who donated. You see them everywhere. I used to go, I used to run often on the track at Burbank High. You want to know who paid money for the track at Burbank High? Just go on the side, there's a list. And then sometimes people have buildings named after them because they gave so much money to do it. Do they not know this text? And you know the worst one that we see all the time now and it drives me mad is when you see these videos on social media, Instagram and Facebook and stuff, and then you'll have someone, it'll be like the, you'll have the minor key music in the background. Hey. Would you help me? I don't have enough money to pay for my tin of beans. Could you help me out? And then, you know, somehow they're videoing all of this, you know, it's like, of course they're gonna give you the money for your tin of beans, you're recording them. <laughs> and so someone says, oh, here, here's a dollar for your tin of beans. Why did you help me today? Why were, you, why were you doing that? Well, you didn't have enough of your beans, I just wanted to help out. Do you know, I do have enough money for my beans, really. And I was just seeing if someone would be generous. Have you ever been to Disneyland? Let's take you to Disneyland. And then you get the rest of the video and they're going to Disneyland and what have you. Oh, you're so kind. You're... And here's a thousand dollars for your kids. And here's a car. And here and they do this. And it drives me mad. I saw one of them yesterday. Well, I've been preparing this in the week. And I saw one yesterday. And I just quoted this passage and I stuck it in the comments. I'm just like, what is this? You know, look at you. And as you see it from Christians as well. Look at me being really generous to somebody. And it's like, well, brilliant. You see all those thousands of likes you've got? That's your reward. That's it. So enjoy them. Enjoy your likes. Enjoy your follows. And of course they do because they get, they get paid by YouTube, by Instagram, by Facebook for all the likes and the follows that they get because of these videos. So are they being generous? No, they're making a living. <laughs> and the whole thing just reeks of self-righteousness and narcissism. Stop it, stop it, stop it. You really want to bless someone? You really want someone to, you want to test someone to see their heart? See if they'll pay for your beans. See if they'll pay for your groceries. And then you're going to give them money. Do it without a video camera. That's how you know that you're really doing it for the right reasons. We are in the most narcissistic period of human history. Everyone wants to be noticed. Everybody wants to be seen. Everybody wants the likes and the follows. This 
this teaching of Christ is more radical now than it ever has been. Could you live your life without social media, without the, without the likes and the affirmations and the what have yous? Could you give in secret? You think that this stuff doesn't happen, but it happens all the time, even in churches. There was a situation in this church 20 odd years ago where there was a big church split that happened. There was a church coup. People were trying to get the pastor out of the church here. This is going back about two, more than two decades now. And there was a big hoo-ha that erupted at the business meeting where everything split. And uh, at one point, a lady was trying to say her view and one of the guys who was deacons, he stood up and said, listen to her. Do you know how much money she gives? <clears throat> That's when you know you're on the wrong side. Right there. And for the record, the answer in my time here is always no. I make it my business to know nothing about anybody's giving. I don't want to know. It could be that one person here provides 90% of the budget. I don't know and I don't want to know. Because if that one person sins, I need to rebuke them. If that one person says I want to do it this way, if I don't think that's the right way, I'm going to say no. I need to be able to treat you all impartially. I don't want to treat you differently. I don't want to give somebody more time or more favor or more, more yeses simply because I know how much they give. I hate that. Partiality is a sin. It doesn't allow, it doesn't come under, is probably a better way of saying, the biblical definition of love. A few weeks ago, uh, Brian read for us from uh, the Bible reading from Leviticus 19, the famous love your neighbor passage. And as we went through that passage, one of the things it says is do not show partiality to rich or poor. We live in a society that, that seems to want to show partiality more than ever before. Well, there's this favored group, let's give them more jobs. There's this favor, oh, you're not in a favor group, okay, we won't do as much for you. Partiality is all the rage right now. Well, God is the one who defines love, and God says that love does not have partiality. So we're not going to treat people differently because they're richer or poorer. We're going to treat everybody the same. That's how we have to do things. And specifically it says, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. That's, that's obviously hyperbole. It's like, hey, right hand, go behind my back while I get my money out of my pocket. You know, that, that's just nonsense, you know. That, that, this, this, is, this is illustrating. But the idea is that it would be really, really, really secret. That's the idea. And, and we as churches have been hindered in many ways because people are like, well, I've got to, if I keep track of my giving, then I get my taxes back and what have you, and then I can give the church more because of the taxes involved. And it all gets really complicated. And that's down for you as individuals to work out how you want to do that. But we have one person in this church, and just so you know who it is, it's not a secret, it's Patty. She's our, uh, our finance lady, and she knows what you give. So when you're giving stuff, if it's written on a check, if you write on an envelope and put cash in the envelope and you put that in the offering, Patty knows. Nobody else knows, and she is forbidden from telling me. She wouldn't tell me if I twisted her arm behind her back really high. She's not allowed to tell me. I am not allowed to know. And you shouldn't want me to know. That's the point of the passage. You shouldn't want me to know. You shouldn't want anyone else in the church to know. Because you're not giving for us. You're giving unto the Lord. That's the principle that's going on here. And so... May giving be private, may giving be a secret, and may nobody know how much you've given, what you've given, when you've given, how frequently or infrequently you have given, other than the Lord. And he knows. And it's him that you're cheating when you don't give. It's him that you are, you are seeking to please when you do give. It is him that you are seeking to to love and to serve. You know, Paul, Paul says to the church in Philippi at the end of the book of Philippians, 
He says, man, I, I don't want you, I don't need you to give to me the way that you're giving to me, but I don't want to tell you to stop because I don't want you to lose the blessings. So if we want to understand biblical giving properly, it's not 10% check your box like the Pharisees. Every week, pray. Every week, pray. God, what would you have me give? Who would you have me give it to? Where should I put it? What should I do with the money that you have given to me this time? Regularly, prayerfully, sacrificially, joyfully, unto the Lord, and we can add to that secretly. That's what biblical giving looks like. And God will reward and bless you because nothing that you have is yours. Everything that you have is ultimately the Lord's. He gives and he takes away. And so part of what giving is, is it's our way of saying, acknowledging, I only have what I have because you've blessed me. And you can take it away in a moment. And in giving you this portion, I'm acknowledging that it's all yours. That's principle of giving. The other example he then gives is praying. <clears throat> Verse 5. When you pray, you are not to be like the hypocrites. Notice the repetition of hypocrites. Who do you think he's describing at this point? He's describing the Pharisees again. So again, he stepped up the ante in his humiliation of them and his condemnation of them. You're not to be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners so they will be seen by men. Truly I say to you, they have their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your inner room, and when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Now this is not a condemnation of, of public prayer. There are time, we as a church, we have prayer meetings. Every Sunday, folks, if you want to join us, 10.30 is when Sunday start. 10.30 is when we have our prayer meeting in the back room and we pray. We pray for the service and we pray for the, for the services of the day, pray for the church. And so we have our service at 10 30, uh, starting at 10.30 with prayer. We pray publicly in church. I always start the meeting with prayer. I always end the service with prayer. We have a public prayer that is normally written out that Jenny did so well for us this morning. Um, and, you know, these are good things, you know. And I don't think it's a problem when Jenny writes a prayer out or Patty writes a prayer out, Michael writes a prayer out, or someone else writes a prayer out and they write it out and someone says, man, that was a good prayer. There's nothing wrong with that either. It's good for us to pray together as a church, corporately, publicly. That's not what it's saying. What the text is saying is don't pray in such a way that people say, wow, look at your prayer. And you know, most of your prayers should be done in private. Just go and be alone. Prayer rooms, closets, prayer closets it used to be called. Where you, you know, <clears throat> I think it was Robert Murray McShane, he died I think before he was even 30. Died very, very young. And in his house, on the floorboards, there were dents where his knees were, where he prayed so much. And you know, we just, however you do it, whether it's at hiking or sitting in a room quietly, we need to be people who pray. Prayer is how we show our humility. Prayer is the difference between being proud and not being proud. Prayer is where we say, I can't do this, God, I need you. It's so important that we are praying people. But as soon as we pray for the sake of others, oh, what a waste of all of that prayer. We have our reward. I used to have a friend, and he used to pray like he was the audio version of the King James Version. <laughs> Father, you know, you talked to, like, to him before the prayer, right? And it would be like, how you doing, buddy? Oh, yeah, I'm cool, I'm fine, how you doing? He was from the Caribbean. I mean, he was like Caribbean, as you guys say. He was just like, he was like very relaxed and, you know, yeah, you know, cool, yeah, all of this, you know. And then he pray, oh, Father, that thou dost would bless upon us this day. And he'd suddenly be talking in like this posture voice, you know. That thou wouldst come 
and that thou wouldst do this and thou wouldst do that. It's like, what? It was all show. He ended up getting divorced after he cheated on his wife. His righteousness was all for show. Don't be someone who pushes your perceived righteousness for others to see. Be somebody who is an absolute prayer warrior. But nobody other than God knows about it. That's the kind of stuff that gets rewarded. That's the kind of stuff that changes lives. That's the kind of stuff that brings about revival and change in the hearts of individuals and sometimes in the providence of God on a much larger scale. That's how you get your reward. And finally today, let's look at verse 7 and verse 8 and see the other principle of prayer. When you are praying, do not use meaningless repetition as the Gentiles do. Remember, he's talking to a Jewish audience here. For they suppose that they will be heard for their many words. I need to be careful at this point because I want to rant and maybe I should rant less than I would like. But Gentile religions traditionally, look at Buddhism, look at Islam, they rely heavily on what we call liturgy, pre-written prayers. A prayer for this day, a prayer for that day, a prayer for this occasion, a prayer for that occasion. And at this point in history, Judaism had become like that. There were prayers for the Sabbath and prayers for this feast and prayers for this festival. And the reason I say I need to be a little bit careful here is I see amongst my peers, and what I mean by peers is not so much age, but people who, who are solidly biblical people, who love the word, is I see an increase in people turning to liturgy again in the church. Why? Because there are people who've said what you want to say in your prayers a lot better than you could a long time before you thought of it. And so there are benefits to looking at prayers. If you haven't got a copy of ancient prayer books, you should probably get some. Because some of them are really good. And you can see the prayers of the Puritans and others, and they are great. And, you know, get some. I can recommend you some. I can show you some. And, and they're great prayers to pray. So I am not saying never do any liturgical prayers. I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is this. When you have liturgical prayers pre-written that you simply repeat, you get very used to repeating them and not thinking about them. And it very easily just becomes a religious routine. Many of us were raised in liturgical church backgrounds, and you know exactly what I mean. And here's the greatest irony of all. In verse 7, Jesus says, don't have meaningless repetition. Okay? Don't do that. What do we do then, Jesus? Verse 8, don't be like them, because your Father in heaven knows what you need. Pray then in this way, verse 9, our Father who is in heaven. What is the most repeated prayer in the history of Christianity? This. And what comes two verses earlier? Don't meaningly repeat things, meaninglessly repeat things. How ironic is that? He's just he's saying, like, what you mustn't do is just repeat the same words when you pray. Okay, what do we do then? Say, our Father who art in heaven, our Father. No, I said, don't repeat. <laughs> don't do that. I knew the words to the Lord's Prayer many, many years before I became a Christian. It was just something that we were taught to repeat. Don't just repeat stuff. I don't want you in your hour of desperation to say, oh no, I need the Lord. Okay, what do I do, what do I do? Our Father, who, who art in heaven, you know, no! 
You cry out to him with everything in your heart. You pray for the needs that you have. But there are principles of prayer that come in the so-called Lord's Prayer. I don't even like that terminology. If you want to have a prayer that's the Lord's Prayer, how about John 17? Where Jesus, who is the Lord, prays. That would be good. But this section that we call the Lord's Prayer, for better or worse, that section is a section that we are teaching next time. And you will see the principles that will guide you in how you should pray. But the one thing you know before we even look at the Lord's Prayer is you don't just meaninglessly repeat it. That's the one thing you don't do. So when you pray, don't just go through some religious experience. What did the Pharisees do? Back to chapter 5. What did the Pharisees do? They checked boxes. And they didn't pursue righteousness. Don't check boxes. Don't say, yeah, I kind of obeyed. Pursue righteousness with all of your hearts. Mourn over your sin and cry out to God that you would be able to walk in a manner worthy of the calling. He's enabled you to do so if you are a Christian. You just have to walk in it. But then as you do righteous things, don't blow it by doing it for the sake of those around you and making it public. And don't blow it by doing it as a religious ritual. So you, have you prayed? Yep, I said my prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hello. check the box. That's not what the Christian life is about. Prayer is the lifeblood of our faith. Prayer is where our faith is won and lost. If you don't pray, you have a problem with your pride. Because you think you can do it without him. Pray before you do something. Pray while you do something. And give thanks in prayer after you've done it. Pray, pray, pray. Make it part of your routine. Pray with your spouse. Pray at church. Pray alone. Just pray, 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 pray. I don't know how much any of you give. And I don't know how much any of you pray. But I hope that you do pray and that you do give. And I trust that God's Holy Spirit is the one who will let you know what you should be doing, will convict you. But don't be a person who is self-reliant. And every person who is prayerless is self-reliant. And you don't get to be a person of prayer by checking a box. I read my prayer from the prayer book today. I said the Lord's Prayer. No, 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 no. Father, you are sovereign, you are in charge, you are everything. I bow before you, I need you. I give you my desires, my concerns, my burdens, my troubles. But I only want your will to be done. Give me what I need. Carry me through this life. Give me a repentant heart. Make me what you want me to be. Oh Lord, I need you. Heartfelt prayers, knowing our absolute inability to do anything of value apart from Him. Let's pray now. <clears throat> Father, we thank you for the text before us today. <clears throat> I look forward to unpacking the Lord's Prayer next week. But Lord, we want to pray to you today. You would change us, change our hearts, change our lives. Who we are is not good enough. Change us, we pray. Only you can do that. May we repent. May we put aside our way of living. And may we embrace you and your way of living. May we bow before your sovereignty, your authority, your, you, your power, you being in charge. You telling us what we should do. May we submit to you in all of this. <clears throat> and may we seek your will to be done and not our own. 
And Father, may we be people who are generous and joyful and consistent in our giving. And may we be people who are generous and joyful and consistent in our praying. And Lord, may we not have any fear of man. May we seek to please you and please you alone. Oh, Father, what a dangerous prayer that is. Knowing that you will have to break our pride. Knowing that you will have to expose our selfishness. That we might become what you want us to be. But we trust you as the master surgeon. To take your scalpel. And to remove the cancer within us. That pride and selfishness. That self-reliance. That desire to be loved and affirmed by those around us. May we love and fear you more than anyone else. May your fear, the fear of you, the desire to do what is right before you, to be aware of your awesome might and majesty and power and glory, may that govern all that we say and that we think and that we do. Amen. Thank you.